Did you know? The origins of ice cream can be traced back to China's Tang Dynasty between 618 and 907 AD. This proto-ice cream was made with fermented cow, goat, or buffalo milk, then cooked with flour and camphor. The mixture would then be placed in a metal tube and lowered into a pool of ice till it froze. According to legend, the concoction was topped with ingredients such as eyeballs and dragon brains. One popular myth claims that the famous explorer Marco Polo tried this treat himself and brought it back to Italy following his historic journey to China. This isn't likely, however, as Marco Polo made no reference to this early ice cream throughout any of his writings. Additionally, Italians didn't experiment with freezing techniques for another three centuries after his return, and ice cream as we know it wouldn't start taking shape until the 17th century. While many physicians and dietitians have raised concerns over ice cream's lack of nutritional value, it wasn't always seen as an unhealthy food. In fact, 18th century Neapolitan doctor Filippo Baldini saw ice cream as a cure, and even wrote an entire book praising it. Baldini proposed that ice creams made with cinnamon could be used to relieve pain, calm nerves, increase perspiration, and improve blood circulation. He also claimed that ice creams made with chocolate could supposedly cure atrophy, scurvy, and arthritis. Baldini also believed that a high daily consumption of sugar was a key factor in leading a long life. This wouldn't be the only time ice cream was touted for its nutritional benefits either. During World War II, American military doctors often prescribed ice cream to soldiers suffering from combat fatigue. In the Air Force, ice cream was also reported to quell the stomachs of queasy pilots after missions. Ice cream was seen as an invaluable means of boosting morale among healthy troops as well. To support this, the Quartermaster Corps of the U.S. Army supplied enough machinery and ingredients to make roughly 80 million gallons of ice cream annually. A small ice cream factory was even built in the South Pacific, which operated at temperatures upwards of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Refrigeration barges, nicknamed ice cream ships, sailed across the ocean to deliver food and ice cream to bases and battlefronts throughout the Pacific theater. By 1943, the U.S. Armed Forces became the largest ice cream manufacturer in the world at the time. Later, in 1945, the U.S. Navy constructed a barge that essentially served as a floating ice cream parlor capable of producing 1,500 gallons of ice cream in a single hour. Soldiers who could not receive these supplies improvised. On one island, the U.S. Navy Construction Battalion fashioned an ice cream freezer from the tubing of an airplane, gears and a starter from a Japanese plane, Japanese shell cases, and other scrap parts. American airmen based in Britain would store large containers filled with ice cream mixtures in the rear gunner's compartment of bomber planes. There, the plane's vibrations, combined with the cold high-altitude temperatures, would create perfectly smooth ice creams. These examples pale in comparison to the love of ice cream among sailors of the USS Lexington. After the Lexington was damaged beyond repair following the Battle of the Coral Sea, a group of sailors managed to save the ship's ice cream supplies and bring it back on deck. As the ship began to sink, the sailors calmly ate ice cream while awaiting rescue. Some even filled their helmets with it before they were ferried to safety. While ice cream was rationed on the U.S. home front, Americans still had it better than many other civilians of the time. This was thanks to both the International Association of Ice Cream Manufacturers and the National Dairy Council, who lobbied for ice cream to be included in the U.S. government's Basic 7 Foods chart. In fact, leader of the Ice Cream Merchandising Institute, George Henrik, turned eating ice cream into a patriotic affair during the war through his Victory Sunday campaign. The campaign asked ice cream shops to make their own Victory Sundays and sell them alongside a 10-cent defense savings stamp to help raise money for the war. The campaign's slogan proclaimed, Keep em buying Victory Sundays to keep em flying. Speaking of Sundays, the honor of inventing them remains a hotly contested battle between a number of American cities, including Buffalo and Ithaca, New York, Evanston, Illinois, Two Rivers, Wisconsin, and more. The town of Ithaca claims that Sundays were invented by Reverend John M. Scott, who regularly stopped by the Platt & Colt Pharmacy following his Sunday services for a dish of vanilla ice cream. According to the town, one Sabbath day in 1891, the pastor decided to change things up and requested his ice cream be topped with cherry sauce and a candied cherry. He immediately fell in love with the dish and decided to call it the Sunday in honor of the day it was created. The town also holds a listing for a cherry ice cream sundae dating back to April 1892 to support its claim. 
The invention of the ice cream cone is similarly disputed. While wafer cones can be traced back to the ancient Greeks, their first use for ice cream is a point of contention. According to British culinary historian Robert J. Weir, the earliest known record of an ice cream cone comes from an 1807 engraving by artist Louis Philibert de Bicourt, which depicts a young woman licking ice cream out of a cone. Later, Victorian cookery teacher and author Agnes B. Marshall, known as the Queen of Ice Cream of her time, published what's believed to be the first recorded recipe for an ice cream cone in 1888. However, Marshall's cones, or coronets as she called them, were intended to be eaten with utensils rather than by hand. Others credit the invention of the ice cream cone as we know it to Italo Marchioni, an ice cream street vendor who frequented New York City's Wall Street. Tired of constantly cleaning glasses and picking up after customers who'd break them, Marchioni wanted to serve his ice cream in a cup that could be eaten itself. Sometime in the late 1890s, he began baking waffles, folding them into cones while they were still hot, and filling them with ice cream after they'd cooled. His creation became such a hit among customers that Marchioni couldn't keep up with demand. So he created a waffle iron built to produce 10 molded ice cream cones at a time, and ultimately patented it. However, ice cream cones wouldn't truly take off until the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Expo in St. Louis, Missouri. Cones became a sensation throughout the expo, introducing many to the new treat for the first time. Numerous vendors have claimed to be the first to offer ice cream cones at the show. Among them, Marcioni himself is rumored to have sold his creations at the expo. However, the International Association of Ice Cream Manufacturers cite Ernest Hamwee as the first to introduce ice cream cones at the show. According to his own account, Hamwee noticed many customers would buy a waffle from him and then immediately purchase ice cream from the neighboring concession stand. Eventually, Hamwee decided to try combining the two treats into one. After a few failed attempts, Hamwee rolled his waffle into a funnel and filled the inside with ice cream. It was an immediate hit, and attendees especially appreciated its portability. As others saw people walking around with ice cream cones in hand, the invention took the exposition by storm, with many vendors creating their own ice cream cones in turn. Regardless of the accuracy of Hamwee's claim, his contribution to their popularization cannot be denied. Immediately following the exposition, Hamwee began work at a number of companies promoting ice cream cones, ultimately heading the Western Cone Company before passing away. Through the efforts of Hamwee and other ice cream cone entrepreneurs, the popularity of both ice cream and cones skyrocketed. In fact, ice cream cones helped push the annual consumption of ice cream in the United States from 50 million gallons in 1904 to 80 million gallons by 1909. Numbers only grew from there. By 1929, Americans were estimated to be eating 365 million gallons of ice cream per year. Ice cream even played a role in the invention of the first successful portable outboard motor. The story goes that Ole Evan Rood was picnicking with a group of friends in a lake near Milwaukee sometime in the early 1900s. Bess Carey then admitted that the heat was making her yearn for ice cream. The others teased Carey, calling her crazy as they would have to row five miles across the lake and back to satisfy her cravings. However, Evan Rood saw this as an opportunity to impress the young woman and personally set off to relieve her sugar tooth. While rowing in the scorching heat, Evan Rood began wondering why someone hadn't invented a motor for small boats and decided to create one himself. In 1909, Evan Rood finally completed his first outboard motor. He created his own company the following year and immediately found success, eventually forming a multi-million dollar corporation, all thanks to Carrie's, by then his wife, love for ice cream. As for making ice cream itself, while many think of sugar, milk, and cream as the main ingredients, you may be surprised to learn that air is just as important of an ingredient itself. Without air, ice cream would be solid, like a popsicle. The amount of air in ice cream directly affects its density, texture, and even taste. This is also why melted ice cream never tastes the same and becomes rough and crunchy even after being refrozen. When ice cream melts, the air inside of it escapes, removing one of its key ingredients. The added air is called overrun within the industry and eventually makes up 30 to 50% of the total volume of commercial ice creams. Typically, cheaper ice cream contains more air, making it softer and fluffier, whereas more expensive ice creams have less, creating a rich, thicker consistency. Dana Cree, the author of Hello, My Name is Ice Cream, The Art and Science of the Scoop, suggests going to your local grocery store and comparing how heavy a pint of the cheapest ice cream feels in one hand next to the most expensive ice cream in the other. Cree writes, the expensive one will feel heavier than the cheap one. The cheaper pint of ice cream, you'll come to realize, is cheaper because there's less of it in the carton. 
Did you also know that for 10 whole years the Oreo O's cereal was only available in South Korea? Or that over half a trillion Oreos have been made to this day? For more facts, check out the Did You Know Food video on Oreo cookies. And if this video whets your appetite for my narration, feel free to check out LGR Foods, where I build tasty sandwiches for your amusement. Or just check out Plain LGR, a channel with fewer sandwiches but plenty of retro tech.